Here we are again at Math for Game Developers. Where were we? Um, we have a a rate function right here. This is our speed of the, the player or the camera or the roller coaster or whatever. And we're trying to integrate it with respect to time so that we can get speed times time, which is the distance that the player has traveled. And to do that, we're going to use a very clever method of integration or of quadrature technically called Simpson's rule. So here is what Simpson's rule is. You have this crazy function. Let's say you have this crazy function. Uh, we are going to sample it at three points. This point is H, this point is H over two, and this point is zero. We're gonna sample it at these three points which I'm gonna draw in blue blue and blue okay uh, and we're going to assume that the function is basically a second degree polynomial that can be drawn with a pretty like a, a pretty smooth curve here so that you can see that's not a very good approximation so far there's a lot of difference between this second degree polynomial and the and the and the actual function but we'll improve on that later. Don't worry about that for now. So we're going to assume that the function is a, is a second degree polynomial. Uh, and we're going to find the, the area of the second degree polynomial by evaluating it at these three points and then applying a weight to each of those values. Okay, and I'll, and I'll show you how that works here. So this, let's say this function right here, this function right here is f of t, okay? Uh, we're going to a naught f of zero and a one f of h over two and a two f of h. We're gonna find this value. We don't know what a naught, a one, and a two are yet. Um, but our, what we're hoping is that if we evaluate right here at zero and multiply by a naught, and then we evaluate it at h over two and multiply by a one, and evaluate at h and multiply by a two, then the area, then that, that answer, the, th the thing that that answer will be the same as the area underneath this, underneath this quadrat, underneath, the, I'm sorry, the second degree polynomial. Uh, so that should be equal to the area, the integral of a second degree polynomial dt. Don't really need the one here, do we? Okay. Now, okay, I know what you're thinking, and what you're thinking is, how can it be possible that I just evaluate a function at three points, uh, and I get a second degree polynomial out of it? That's crazy talk. Uh, you're crazy, George. And the reason you can do it is that eat both, both of these three evaluations and the second degree polynomial are constrained by three things. So you have, in the second degree polynomial, you have three coefficients, c0, c1, c2. And when you evaluate this function at three points, you have three coefficients at the beginning of each uh, result of the evaluation. You have a, a naught, a one, and a two. So you've picked three points uh, determined by three coefficients and a second degree polynomial is completely determined by three points. So they end up being the same thing. Now that's kind of a weird argument and um, it might take a while to, sit, to, to sink in really. Uh, try drawing a graph, try this, draw a graph with three points on it and then try and find more than one second degree polynomial that goes through all three of those three points. And, and you'll, you'll discover that it doesn't exist. There's only one quadratic function that can go through all three points. Uh, so anyway, 
Now, since we are assuming that this f function is basically a quadratic, that means I can take, I can take this second degree polynomial right here and plug it in for each one of these. This is a very clever trick. It's kind of weird and clever. We're assuming that it's second degree polynomial and then we're using that assumption um, to do these evaluations at these three points and, 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 and come up with an answer. So what do we do at that point? We have a naught times the evaluation of this second degree polynomial at zero. Now, if, if t is zero, then these two terms cancel out. And so we're just going to get c naught. And then a one times a bunch of stuff. We're going to evaluate it at, uh, at h over two. So we get h squared over four plus c one h over two plus c naught plus a two, and then we evaluate the function again at h, c1 times h plus c naught. All right, uh, and that should all be equal to this integral, which I now have to expand. So let's expand it real quick. Let's expand this integral. When we integrate this, we get one third C2 times T cubed plus. I'm just using the rules of integration that I've covered in a previous video. Go find my uh, how to integrate polynomials video. C naught times T. Uh, evaluated at zero and H. Not B, but H. So now you can see that we have a bunch of terms that are kind of similar. We have a term with C naught here and a term with C naught here and a term with C naught here and a term with C naught here. So the coefficient that sits in front of my T naught here, which is I think, I think just gonna be H, uh, has to be equal to the, co the sum of the coefficients of these three naught, C naughts. This is really similar to some some problems that um, you probably solved during like high school or, or some, some grade school that you had, right? Uh, the coefficient of this C1 has to be equal to the coefficients of, of the sums of coefficients of these C1s and same thing, this, this C2 and this C2 coefficients should equal one third T cubed. Now I'm not gonna do all that work, but it turns out that we can solve for A0, A1 and A2 and this is what you get. I'm going to write it here. h over 3 times f evaluated at 0 plus 4 f f evaluated at h over 2 plus f evaluated at h. And this is Simpson's rule. So let me try and restate this one more time because it's kind of tricky. If I evaluate, if I evaluate uh, this function at zero and then multiply by h over three, and then I evaluate it at h over two and multiply by four h over three, and then evaluate it at h and multiply by h over three, then I will get a pretty good approximation. I will get a second degree polynomial approximation. In other words, if my, if my function is a second degree polynomial, it will be a perfect match. It won't be approximation at all, it will be exact. So then the way to, the way to get this approximation better with this complicated function is just to repeat this. Okay, here's my complicated function. And instead of doing it just once, I'm going to do it a bunch of times for every small section of this code. Now notice how I tapped three times. So, okay, I actually have all of these midpoints, all of these h over two midpoints. So we have to count up what our new weights for all of these guys are gonna be, right? So our, our weight, we're, I'm gonna ignore h over three for now um, because that is, in, that is weighted in all of these guys. So let's just look at this one right here, the very first one, zero at zero. Well, we see he's gonna be in here once, okay? 
this guy right here, he is also ones, but he's he's in two different uh, Simpsons rules. We're going to do him for this guy on the right, and then we're going to do him again for this guy on the left. So his weight should be two. His weight should be two, and his weight should be two, all the way to this guy's weight should be two. But this guy's weight is back to one. Okay. Uh, this guy right here in the middle, his weight is four, and he's not shared with any of the other Simpsons rules that we're doing. So the weights are going to be h over three times f of x naught plus four f of x one plus two. So this is this is x one right here, and this is x two. Here's x naught. I hope that's not too small, but it's x naught, x one, x two, x three, and so on. So we have one, and then four, and then two at x at x two, and then four at x three, and then two at x four, and then so on, until finally we're gonna have a we're gonna have a four at uh, x. Uh, let's see, this will be n minus one, and then uh, f of x n. So we've taken all of these Simpsons rules. We basically, we've applied Simpsons rule over and over and over. Um, and this is what we get. We get a big sum where every odd uh, term has a coefficient of four and every even term, except for the beginning and the end, has a coefficient of two. You sum all of those evaluations up, you multiply by h over three, and that gets you a, actually a pretty good approximation um, it's one or two, I forget how many, one or two uh, orders of magnitude more precise than, the, than just making boxes naively like we did before. Uh, so great, now we're going to go to the coding section and we're going to see how all of this works with a crazy function. So this time we're just going to value... Um, uh, So this time we're just going to evaluate a simple exponential function. Uh, we'll eventually get to back to our spline. That'll be next video. For now, we're just going to, to use a simple exponential so we can see how this works, okay? So let's see here. Um, this is actually the board. So this is the boring rectangles method, which is actually called midpoint rule because I calculate the midpoint of each rectangle and then I evaluate the function there, and that serves as the height of the rectangle. And then I go ahead and multiply it by the, the base. I know this variable is h, but it's actually the base. Um, but it's the same h as we were doing with the math. Uh, so that serves as our rectangle area, and then we sum all of the rectangle areas together. Now over here in composite Simpsons rule, uh, I do... Let's see, I do, I'm do. i doing Simpsons rules. So the endpoints, I their, their weight is one, so I just throw them together. And then I have two loops. One that adds up all of the, um, all of the things that we're gonna multiply by four that have a weight of four. And then another loop that multiplies, that adds up all the things that we're gonna multiply by two. And then I have to write the last line right here still, which is gonna be h divided by three uh, times Let's see, that will be the endpoints, which are, their weight is one, so I don't multiply by anything. And then four times the stuff that I multiplied times four, and two times the stuff that I multiply by two. Uh, quick note here, I'm using doubles for these calculations just so that we can have lots of room to play with. Uh, but normally you wouldn't really need that much precision, you should use floats. I'm just using doubles here so that we can See with more precision what's going on. So let's compile that. Does it compile? Yes. Uh, here we go. We're going to run the debugger. Let's just run the program and see what it does. So first I print out the actual value. Here it is. This is e minus 1, the, the constant um, e minus 1. So that is 1.718281828. Uh, okay, and then here's the boring rectangles version with n equals 2, by the way. We're only making two rectangles here, so you see it's not very accurate. It's only accurate to two digits. 
But again, with two rectangles, uh, composite Simpsons rule is accurate to four digits. So composite Simpsons rule is twice as accurate, you could say. Now let's kick the number of boxes up to 64. We're going to kick it up a lot. And we're going to rebuild. And we're going to go in here again and run it again. And we can see that the boring rectangles method is now much more accurate, five digits. But the composite Simpsons method is pulling ahead. It's not only it not only remains more accurate, but the number of digits by which it's more accurate has also increased. So you get a lot of wins with composite Simpsons rule. You get a lot of accuracy here. You can pick. You can either say, with the same number of boxes, I am going to be much more accurate, or you can get the same accuracy that you want with fewer boxes. Usually what you say is, well, I desire accuracy to the sixth decimal place, and then you figure out how many boxes you need to go to that decimal place, and it will be many fewer boxes with composite Simpsons rule than with, than with the boring rectangles method. So, so good. That means that our composite Simpsons rule works. So next week, we're going to put it all together. We're going to see it all at work all at once. We're going to get... Um, composite Simpsons rule and we're going to do some root finding and we're going to use a, do, do that root finding on the arc length formula using composite Simpsons rule all together all in once and we're going to do it to finally get those constant rate uh, camera the constant rate roller coaster things that we were making oh my god it was like four videos ago by this point um, so great I'll see you next time